Um, all right, recording is going. Hi and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Helmut, Helmut Warm Whitaker, and I am here with two wonderfully amazing ladies who are dear, dear friends. And one of them is my wife, Kay, Kay Cordell Whitaker. Hi, Kay. Hi. And the other one is our friend Laura, Laura Keddy. And we have talked in more detail about who, who we are, who they are. So I'm not going to go into great depth here. If you haven't watched the previous uh, webinars yet, number one and two, uh, go to katasebreaddoor.com and you can catch up and um, learn a lot of things leading up to this one. And Kay is the author of The Reluctant Shaman and Sacred Link. And uh, she also is the creator of The Red Door and The Red Door Healing Work. And just a few among the many pretty amazing things that she does. And Laura has been studying with us for more than five years. <laughs> And she has a working farm and is building a retreat and, and teaching center on that farm. And she fell in love with Katase and the Red Door. And she's helping us to bring the teachings out into the world. And we're building a beautiful collaboration. It's very, very exciting. So, and today, today's webinar in the Healing Arts series and the Katase Red Door Healing series is called What Makes the Katasa Red Door and the Ancient Healing Arts So Effective. Before we get started, I need to read you our disclaimer. And here goes the Katasa and Katasa Red Door disclaimer. <clears throat> Excuse me. The healing work and teachings that we offer and that you are receiving stem from ancient spiritual healing traditions and are not intended as a medical or psychological service in the allopathic sense of the term. We do not make any medical claims. The ideas, information, procedures, and suggestions we provide are based on those ancient spiritual traditional healing traditions and are not intended as a substitute for consulting with a medical professional. K, I, or anyone else working with us shall not be liable or responsible for any loss or damage allegedly arising from anything we provide. Our healing work and teachings are rendered within the, con within the context of the ancient traditions they are based on. Everyone receiving healing work or teachings from us is wholly and entirely responsible for their own health and health care. All right, we're ready. What makes the Katasa Red Door and the ancient energy healing arts so effective? Hey. Well, this kind of hooks back into the last session where we talked about um, quantum effects of the Katasa healing, ancient energy healing, and the Red Door healing. When um, when we're utilizing nature at its most fundamental levels, um, which would be described uh, with quantum physics as things that are uh, energetic, all kinds of different energies, uh, currents, and energy fields, as well as the smallest kinds of particles that we um, know about. So atoms, subatomic particles like electrons, protons, neutrons. And then what they break down into all these little tiny, uh, tiny, tiny little pieces of matter. This, uh, this is where the heart of everything really is, is at this level at this super, super small level. And with the, this, this whole quantum effect, what that, what that means is that 
from the level of energies and the level of the smallest pieces of matter. When they do things, when they change, when they uh, interact with each other, create energy fields and currents, these seem like very, very tiny things because they're so little. And energies, of course, are unseen and they seem very distant to us or small or insignificant, but couldn't be farther from the truth because these are the things that are the most powerful. A little teeny change at that level turns into massive effects, massive results on our human physical level and, and even bigger. <clears throat> it's what happens on this micro micro level is happening on all the other levels and all the macro levels the universal cosmic levels so when we just think about that just just kind of think about what that really means what does that mean uh, to, to humans what does that mean to you uh, to us what does it mean when we do energy healings? What does it mean when we're using the red door? It means that we can take these energies, we can take our energetic focus of our consciousness, that's an energy. Our consciousness is an energy, it's producing energy, we're focusing this energy, we're aiming it at something very, very, very specific. When we're doing that, we're affecting energies that are uh, in us, around us, um, in the universe, along the way to, to our subject, to our target area, in the target. We're stimulating activities in the subatomic levels and the atomic and molecular levels. And it all sorts, sort of uh, rolls uphill, you could say from the subatomic uh, to the bigger and the molecular, to the cells, to the organs, to the whole body, a whole system. And big changes happen. Big things, big, noticeable. From the way we've been taught to think in, in our modern culture and modern science, uh, this just doesn't seem logical and it doesn't seem possible. But this is the foundation of everything that we are and everything that is in our universe, physical and energetic. Everything that's in our 3D time space and, and outside of that. We stir things up. We move things, we create new things, we take some things apart, put new things together. We're doing this constantly, even though we don't know we're doing it. This is how the world works. This is how the universe rolls. The, uh, the kingpin here, the center of it, is consciousness. The whole universe is consciousness. Everything is conscious. Everything's alive. Everything is, is thinking and feeling and interacting, communicating, sending information and energies back and forth all the time, on all levels, macro levels to human levels to micro levels and back. The key to it, the center of it, the motor and the, the fuel is consciousness and our ability to manipulate consciousness, to collect it in ourselves, to focus it, to make a decision of what we want to do with it and take that action and stay focused on it, staying focused on that action until it is complete. 
the, the power of these, these energies, the power of consciousness, the power of the energies of everything around us. Things that we aren't familiar with in our culture. Uh, we don't really know much of anything about. The power of just plain old geometry. We've talked about that a little bit before. But everything that is in 3D time space has geometry. And every piece of geometry, whether it's two-dimensional, like a drawing on a piece of paper, or three-dimensional, there are energies moving in that. If you have a stick, you, you have, I'll use my pencil. <laughs> this is, you know, a stick, a long skinny thing. There's energy inherent in here. There's, there's energies that this is taking from the space around it. And it's moving it down this line, down the line, and down the line the other way. There's energies that are spiraling because this is round, has roundness. So energies are spiraling and they're going in both ways. There's energies that are coming off of this. And this is just a simple form. This is, you know, just a plain, long, skinny cylinder, like a stick. Seems very, very simple, but I say it is not quite that simple. It has geometry, and geometry is vibrant and it's interactive. We think of these things as an inanimate object. There's no, we do think in this culture, there's no life here, that there's nothing happening here. But quite the contrary, there's a lot happening here. All these energies moving along in these different directions. Energy coming into this stick, energies coming out of it. It's controlling the energies in its immediate atmosphere, changing them, moving them into to new places, new directions, new instructions. Every single piece of geometry does that. Let's think about that for a second. Look around, the, you're probably all in a building, I would think, most of you. Look around. Look at the geometry that you're in. You got walls, you got floors, you got ceiling, you got furniture. You have windows and doors, uh, all kinds of shelves, all kinds of different little things. They're all making the, the energies that their geometry forms. They're making those fields. Every energy pattern, every energy flow, every energy field has power. It has movement, it has direction, it has consciousness behind it. Might not be immediate human consciousness that is making the energies flow through this pencil, the stick. Nature does it all by itself because of the geometry. And we utilize those things. We utilize the geometry of our own body. In the red door, we use the geometry of the bowl. That is a very sophisticated piece of geometry. Doesn't seem like it. In our, our culture, our modern culture, we, we would tend to think that that is a very simple shape and it's made out of wood. And it just seems like a really um, simple, inanimate, object, maybe something that you should be piling fruit into or something. But if you just think about it, just kind of think and imagine that shape, cylinder, 
and where the energies are flowing and what kind of energies that they are interacting with, which changes that form and creates a field of energy and energy movement. That is, that is absolutely astounding what that little piece of geometry does. The sun geometry is very neutral. Some of it can be really um, destructive, not healthy to be around. I'm sure everybody has, has gone into a building somewhere where the geometry was just all wrong. It didn't look right, it didn't look good, it didn't feel right, it felt discombobulating, unhealthy, energy depleting. And we've been into places that felt good. They looked good, they felt good, they made you feel good, they, they were energizing. The geometry is really, really, really important. Our human geometry is a little bit of what makes uh, us able to use our consciousness to focus our energies and our attention to bring these um, astounding changes about in healing and in other things, manifesting things. We're just starting to rediscover these, uh, the arts, the arts of consciousness, the arts of energy, the arts of um, the medicines of geometry. We're just, just starting to do that. We did it before on this planet, and most of that knowledge was uh, destroyed, but not all of it. For instance, when I was developing the bowl, and I had gotten to where I really figured out the size, the very best size and shape, and some of the materials, the colors, I went into the University of Oregon bookstore. And I didn't have a wallet on me. I didn't have any cash in my pocket. Didn't have a credit card, nothing. But I ran in there. I really wanted to uh, check something out. And one of the shelves that I always went by was um, where all these different professors that were on campus, but other professors around the country, uh, who had produced books on their studies, had those books there on the shelf. And there was this little paperback book that was about uh, digs, uh, archaeological digs that were done in uh, uh, Georgia and Atlanta uh, of the early, early Mississippi culture. These are the mound builder people. Early Mississippi culture. And they would uncover... Uh, whole stretches of buildings with little rooms and uh, like houses, you know, just a whole big village of them. And in almost every single room, there was a cylinder uh, made out of terracotta, kind of a reddish colored terracotta. And some of them still had red coloration, like a red paint that was on them. They were perfect, perfect cylinders, and they're the exact size and shape of the red door. They didn't have, they weren't fired. The terracotta was not fired. They didn't have any remnants of anything in it. It wasn't a smudge bowl, um, and it wasn't um, a food bowl. It wasn't made to make food or display food or hold food or water, or anything like that. It had no remnants of anything. And they were all, almost all of them, all the same. A few of them were slightly different sizes, bigger. But most of, of them were this exact shape and size. They, they called them basins. And they had no idea whatsoever why they were there and what they were used for. But 
um, I had a pretty good idea. I had a very good idea. My, my thoughts, my immediate feeling was that uh, these people, the, the really, really early first mound builder peoples coming um, from someplace else, coming out of the Atlantic, coming up from South America, Central America, landing in, in uh, the southern states, that these were people from um, a very ancient culture before Atlantis sank, before the deluge, antediluvian, and they had a lot of incredible knowledge. They, they had all kinds of, of interesting things that they knew about, knew how to do with geometry. Exactly like uh, the geometry that has been used in things like the pyramids and stone circles, um, the, the huge geometry that we see in, in all these, these buildings, ancient, ancient, ancient remains that are left in different areas all over the planet, and even underwater that have been sunk. They knew about the geometry. They knew how to make geometry that would create uh, stability and health and would create energies that they could direct with their own mind and use for all kinds of different things. Healing, certainly, being one of them. And I think this is a remnant of that kind of knowledge that the people brought with them and kept alive. I didn't have any money. I couldn't buy the book. I was going to go back later and get it. I went back later and the book wasn't there anymore. And the people at the counter couldn't find any, any sign of it. So <laughs> whatever that means, I don't know. But this kind of knowledge, it's been around before. And now it's coming back up. And it is astoundingly powerful. And we can do so many different kinds of things with it by focusing our consciousness, our attention. That's, you know, the, the red door, um, it sits there, it does its thing, it's making these energy fields, it cleans the space, psychically cleans the space just because of the geometry and sucks it away, turns it into. Uh, it's like it recycles it, uh, turns it into free, clean energy that can be used again in some other way. But for the, the other kind of things that it's capable of doing, it, it takes the interaction of human consciousness to focus the attention and the content of the focus and finding a target to broadcast to and utilizing that shape to create that scalar wave that can reach anybody anywhere on the planet and on the moon uh, and probably anywhere in the universe <laughs> instantaneously works outside of time and space. This is this is all done because of our human consciousness. So when we put these things together, this is incredibly powerful. I've got how many years? Um, 30 years of working this, 35 years. Uh, been doing it for a long time. Had, uh, had a lot of really dark hair then. <laughs> the stories of, of what this, this technology is capable of. It just blows my mind and I've been working with it all this time and I still get just super jazzed and excited every time I see these incredible results. This one young lady that I was working on, she 
I was about 17 or 18, I think, when I started working on her. Um, Hawaiian, lived in Hawaii, was a surfer. She had been um, refurbishing an old piece of furniture and, and was trying to strip it with chemicals, and it splashed in her eyes. And she damaged both eyes. Um, she created a great deal of exterior damage, but also interior, and disrupting the, the retina on both eyes, uh, pulling it off of the back of the eyeball, dislodging. She was having little uh, bits of cataracts forming and glaucoma. Um, her optical nerve was um, showing a little damage in the beginning. And she had operations, she had chemicals, she had steroids, tons, way too many steroids, which didn't do anything. They didn't help at all. And they were actually giving her more glaucoma and more cataracts. And if you use them long enough, they can um, completely detach your retina from the back of, of the eyeball and the optic nerve. So she, they were just creating more damage. So as I started to work with her, I was doing both the red door and the ancient energy healings. And we worked sometimes twice a week. Uh, a lot of times it was once a week and worked with her for, I guess, a couple of years total. Uh, her retinas attached back perfectly to the back of her eyes and to the optic nerve. The optic nerve um, healed itself. The um, glaucoma and the cataracts, uh, they were improving, but um, she, you know, it was too late for some of it because of the doctors talked her into having cataract surgery and replacing her lens. So there wasn't a whole lot else that could be done with the energy uh, around the, the plastic that was sitting in the middle of her eye. But cleaning up the rest of it and, and um, healing the shape of the interior of the eye, the fluid itself, and the little hole, you got these little holes in the inside of your eyeball where the, the fluid is supposed to be slowly draining out. And then you get new fluid that comes in, uh, cleaning it all the time, healing and cleaning and nourishing. And when that clogs up, you have glaucoma. And it begins to have pressure and swelling, and it distorts the whole vision. It can uh, make you blind in it, um, if it goes long enough untreated. But that was completely fixed. The holes... Um, healed themselves. The drainage became normal again. And from being legally blind, she went to being um, having a little bit better than 20-20 vision in both eyes. So she went from surfing, almost totally blind, <laughs> to being able to surf with her eyes back. Now that's that's utterly, utterly astounding. That's, that's what this kind of healing can do. Uh, that's why these, these little tiny things uh, with the energies and the focusing of energies and the changing of the electromagnetic currents in her body, in her eyes, and the electrical fields, the magnetic fields in her eyes, and increasing them. Uh, things can't heal in your body until that magnetic field intensity has increased. That also makes the electrical activity increase. But the important half is the magnetic field because when that gets intense enough, the healing can actually happen. You can't really fix or heal anything 
um, by yourself, with your mind, with any, any pills, anything, until that magnetic field is brought up in intensity and held there. And that's what these healing techniques do. That's, that's how they um, start the operation of making these changes. So when we think about the energies that are around us, the, the ones we're most familiar with, of course, are electrical energies and fields and magnetic energies and fields that come from the electrical activity. Um, magnets that you stick on the wall, on the, on the refrigerator. Those are um, what we would describe in the ancient healings as uh, a little bit coarser. They're, they're more of the 3D time space world. The other kinds of energies are called subtle energies. And this is what we use with our thinking. This is the primary energy uh, of our existence as a physical body that's alive and moving. We, it's often called life energy. These subtle types of energies, this is what um, is moving along on this pencil, on this stick. When we can collect them together and give them a single goal, a single task, a single uh, form to take, single information, a uh, task to do, then miracles happen. Miracles happen. So that's why it's so powerful. Far more powerful than any of the pharmaceuticals. Most of our pharmaceuticals um, are really pretty dangerous stuff. Many of them don't do the thing that they claim that they're doing. And they have so many other side effects that are very, very, very unhealthy. I think most of us know that by now. That information has been coming out and coming out and coming out from, you know, the deep, dark secrets of the pharmaceutical companies and whistleblowers, people doing other kinds of research, finding out what's really in those substances and how they really act in the body and interact with our, our chemistry and our electricity and our subtle energies. They really are not the very best thing that humanity has uh, delved into and, and developed. Surgery, now that, that has its place. It can be helpful in certain circumstances. But there's so much of it that is, is done when it isn't really needed. And that just leads to more problems and more problems. So uh, people are getting tired of that. They don't trust standard medicine. They don't trust the MDs. They don't trust pharmaceutical companies. And we're watching as people all around us and our loved ones uh, have been supposedly taken care of by the standard medicine. And they just get worse. They just keep getting worse. So there's something really, really wrong with that, that picture, with the, the standard medicine approach. And we need to find, uh, rediscover, we need to look into and really, really rediscover what the ancients knew and what they were uh, doing, utilizing, how they made tools out of thought and geometry and substances like water, real pure water, fire. There's, 
there's so much left to discover in what these things can do and what our consciousness can do and achieve. And one of the things I would hope to do is to be inspiring to people so that they keep working with these things, keep researching and discovering, rediscovering these incredibly powerful tools. Thank you. I think you're well on your way with that. <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really cool. Mm. Oh, thank you so much. You're very welcome. We are going to take questions again. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your window, most likely. So if you click that, you can uh, write in your questions. And Laura wants first tips, so. <laughs> My gosh, I, bet, I, I, like, I didn't do a very good job of <laughs> writing down questions, um, but I was hoping maybe you could talk more on the, because you talked about the effectiveness of the clearing of the bowl and the effectiveness. Um, what a great story. I love that story. I've heard you talk about that specific client before and it's still, I mean, there's, I, I think we need one um, live recorded one just on testimonials from everybody because there's, she's one of many of these amazing stories of things that shouldn't be possible, made possible with health specifically. But one of the areas I was hoping you'd talk more on it was the effectiveness as a communication device, is using it to find maybe health answers instead of, because I know with a lot of the cases, because I my dad's older um, and, you know, is the classic, whatever the doctor says is true. And he doesn't understand that doctors are still playing the guessing game. And how the how the red door can maybe help with the just the understanding or communicating of what maybe what's going on with your health. I mean, not even getting into the healing part, but just answers. Well, that's part of the protocol of how we utilize the um, the energies, the medicines of what the red door is. In the protocol, we're uh, asking a series of questions. We start off with permission. Uh, and do I have permission to be working on this person? And if so, then we dive in. And we have a whole bunch of lists that have been created of different body parts and different diseases and, uh, that we can go through and check and ask. And we ask questions like, um, how healthy uh, the body is. That's a good way to start, a good place to start. <laughs> how healthy is this body? And we have a whole system and a number system that uh, describes this and allows you to compare from you know, one thing to another because uh, the number system is consistent between one, I mean, zero and 100. So we start with how healthy is the whole body together as a whole? And that would include all the energy uh, aspects and chakras and as well as the physical things, the organs, all the way down to the teeniest little pieces and molecules. And so we get that number and that gives us an idea of how they're doing, uh, kind of a first general picture of how the the whole system is hanging in there or not. Because I'm kind of thinking like a mom, you know, it's like we've all had those kids, like, are they really sick? <laughs> <laughs> the liver, <laughs> you know, it's like, is this, I don't want to go to school or is this the, is this a real deal and I need to. Oh yeah. Yeah. We can answer questions like that too. 
for sure. <laughs> well, and it's great with pets. I mean, under pets, it. I can't really tell you too much. Cats who, um, in their stoic way of being, kind of hide symptoms. They yeah. hide a lot of symptoms, and it makes it really hard to distinguish whether they're not feeling so good. So, yeah, any of yeah. these, your plants, your yeah. house plants, your garden, your vegetables, uh, the whole garden as a whole, a single plant. You know, you can, you can measure any, any of these things and more, way more. So the very first question would be, how healthy is this body? So take a look at your dad and you're kind of worried and, you know, things, he's old, he's not, uh, he's not behaving like a 30 year old anymore. <laughs> so, so you get your number and you kind of, well, yeah, okay, we're going to have to um, look a little deeper and find out why the systemic number uh, is not so great because there's something that's really sick in there that's pulling everything down. And then you go check your kid. <laughs> <laughs> Do they have a test tomorrow and they want to play hooky? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or is there something really wrong? So you test their systemic number and maybe it's all bouncy high. It's, you know, like, woohoo. Well, that can make you suspicious right away. And then you can ask other things that are a little more specific, like, um, does he really have a stomach ache? <laughs> does he really have a cold? Are there germs here? You, you keep thinking up, you know, more and more appropriate questions for, for what's there. And, and you get your answers. I love it with the vet. The vet always says, is your cat acting, uh, is it sleeping more? And I'm like, it's a cat. <laughs> you know how I mean, anybody who has a cat to ask him, <laughs> I mean, would more be 12 hours <laughs> versus, <laughs> I don't know. So having the answers, that's, yeah. yeah. Being able to get those really basic answers and, you don't really need to go you know, a whole lot farther than that if it's uh, you know, something that scares you. Uh, but it's so simple and it's so easy. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you learn how to do it accurately, you, you do it and it's accurate. What astounds me and what uh, I just love teaching the radionics class because so many people in the beginning, they're thinking, how could I possibly be accurate? I'm beginning. I could barely make this pendulum work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Are you sure that this is flying in the right direction? So they do. They, as soon as they, they get the beginning hang of it, which is, doesn't take long at all. They're asking questions and they're focusing and they're getting real answers. They're getting accurate answers. So there's, there's no real reason to not take the next step, which would be to learn how to ask uh, questions that are a little bit more pinpointed, a little more detailed. Like, okay, the kid doesn't feel so good. This is, you know, we're looking at this and we need to find out where, why, what is it? And we ask, um, are there germs here? Are they viruses? Are they bacteria? Are they parasites or fungus? Or are they a mixture? Because a lot of things aren't just a single germ. They're a mixture of things. And if we use the lists that are provided with the radionics, we can ask those kind of questions going down the list. Is it this germ? Is it that germ? Right, right down the list. And you'll get the answers. The right ones will, will turn up. You'll get a yes. And it starts to make a picture. You start to understand a little bit more and a little bit more. So, okay, so they have uh, strep. That's pretty popular. <laughs> Where? Is it systemic? Is it in their blood and systemic all over the place? And then 
you find out, yes or no. Maybe it's you need to look at specific organs. Okay, is it in the lungs? Is it in their digestive tract? Uh, is it in some other part of the body? We just keep looking down the list and questioning everyone. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? And we get a picture. We find out exactly what that is. And that's a great piece of knowledge to have. That can give you a lot of different ideas and clues about other things to do and what to feed them or not and all that kind of stuff. But um, the really, really super interesting thing that the, the Red Door does and that we can do with the energy healings as well, once we have uh, gotten the picture of what's in there, what's making them sick and where is it, is the, the questions that you ask about um, what do I do now to fix this? What can I broadcast? Because remember, this is a two-way conversation, a two-way phone line through the scalar <laughs> lines of, of um, our, our subspace, our void, this, we're talking on the phone through the void and we find out, well, what do we need to broadcast? What are the things that we can send to this person that's sick through the scalar wave that's going to help change and clear up what's, what's there, what's making them ill? And things that we can broadcast to help boost the body system. We can broadcast things that will kill the germs, that will take them away. But if we don't do something that boosts their, their body up, the, the body strength and integrity, the immune system, then they're just gonna turn right around and get sick all over again real quick. So we always need to do both. And the system that is uh, devised to use with the red door, uh, all that information is there. You just need to go through and ask the questions and find out what's going to work best. What do I need here? What do I need there? And then broadcast it. It's so cool. <laughs> that was a nice excursion into the... Um, the healing processes yeah. and the processes of using it. Um, that's what the class that's coming is all about. That and more. Do you have anything else, Laura? There's a bunch of questions that people... No, I'd like to... I was reading some of these questions off the side. I think those are some good ones. <laughs> I'm sure I'll have more. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's start with the questions that are online. Um, Diane is asking, uh, are there multiple ways of raising the electromag electromagnetic frequency to initiate, allow healing, or is there one particular way you focus on? There's a number of different ways that we can accomplish it. With the um, ancient energy healing, that's the first thing we do. We're sending life energy, subtle energies, um, electrical energies to the subject. And as we do that, as you, and you can do that with the, something that delivered an electrical device. If you give them that electricity, electrical current, not enough to kill them, we're talking about really subtle, small, uh, intensities. The magnetic field will increase with the electrical current and the electrical field. When we're doing the energy healing, we're intending the magnetic field to increase first and the electrical field tags along behind. And it's all through thought and focus. This is all consciousness that is streaming all this energy, 
um, and the information into the subject. With the red door, because of the nature of what it is, how this all this energy of existence that is around it, that it is collecting, it is sending um, life energy, all these subtle energies, and electrical energy to the subject. It is increasing, automatically increasing, both the electrical and the magnetic field and the state of electrons, the number of electrons in the body and the electrical currents. We are very electrical beings, very electrical. Everything, uh, we're far more electrical than we are chemical. The electrical part of the chemical actions has to be there first. That's what chemical interactions are. They're basically electrical interactions. So when we keep that in mind, that the importance of the electromagnetic field in our own body and, and in the body of whoever you're trying to help, that is, that's first, that's primary. The bull does it automatically. As you are sending things to it, your, your subject, your target, your client, uh, it does it automatically. And to increase it even more, there are things in the manual that are about electromagnetic um, fields and currents that you can apply and, and utilize those. And that makes it even more specific and more intense. I hope that answers. Great. Laura, do you want to take, read a couple of those too? Sure. I have to take off these. <laughs> it's that small print. Um, I believe this is Deborah. Um, yeah. How does the rapid shift of magnetic north 40 to 55 um, kilometers a year affect us, especially since, according to science, magnetic south is not shifting as rapidly. Affect us, affect us in all life. So how does that affect us in all life? Um, and can the red door help us to rebalance ourselves and perhaps even the planet? Hmm. So I guess the question too is, does it need rebalancing? <laughs> <laughs> well, the planet's taking care of herself. She's, she's pretty old, pretty big, pretty ancient, kind of knows what she's doing. <laughs> she's, we don't have to worry about her. It's not, um, the movement of it is not anything that affects us. But what does affect us is that through uh, the last several millennia, the magnetic field of the planet, the intensity has been diminishing a little tiny bit here and there. But through a long period of time. And the Egyptian teacher, uh, was was very aware of this um, and said that the Egyptians had been very, very aware of it and knew that uh, it was declining and was going to continue to decline. They knew this, um, you know, like seven, eight, nine, ten thousand years ago. They knew that it's, it was starting to head in that direction. And it's a, it's a cycle. It's a cycle that the planet uh, does. It's part of its being. But for humans, the, the lower that magnetic field that our environment gets, we tend to copy it um, mm -hmm. with our own magnetic field. We, we tend to mimic that, follow it, because we're deeply connected to it. So what they recommended was um, 
that if you want to have a stronger magnetic field within your own body and your own system and have it there uh, permanently, that you need to do the special ceremonies that raise, they open up your energy channels and raise your, um, your life energy uh, volume. And that's uh, things like Kundalini, Kundalini uh, rising type practices or ceremonies. The Egyptians had their own way of doing it in the temples, which was, uh, that's a totally different kind of thing but it is a lot easier than um, Kundalini practices. And the Peruvians, the Katasi system, uh, we have a ceremony called the Dance of the Earth Fire Serpent that opens up the channels, helps you and your body and your system, your consciousness, reopen your channels. Uh, we're born with them open, but in our culture, we learn how to close them down. And especially in certain areas, we close the channel down and we don't let too much life energy in. That's one of our biggest problems. And that means our electromagnetic field is even lower because we don't have that energy current going on in us. But when we do this, the ceremonies that open the channels and allow that life energy to move in both directions in its full volume, uh, it's also an electrical thing. We have electrical energy that's moving through us and coming from the earth and from the sun and the galaxy. And that increases our magnetic field just naturally, just being that way. But we can increase it even more with our consciousness, with focusing our consciousness. And when we do that, we have better health for sure much better and we're able to um, develop our consciousness and our attention our ability to focus so much more and that's where that's where the the gold is that's those are the real goodies the real power the ancients all of them say real power is your attention and your ability to focus that attention. So that's something to just ponder and think about, what does that mean? How do we do that? What would happen to me when I did it, if I do it? When we can, the more we can do to increase the life energy flowing through us, the better our healing is, whether we're using a red door or the ancient healings. The better our own health is, the better just about everything in our life can be. Our, our own development in, in studying these kinds of things and improving ourselves and raising our own consciousness this this is the first step this is the key this is where where it begins open up that energy channel and start learning about how to focus your attention the red red door work teaches you very rapidly how to focus your attention and hold it there the ancient energy healings and there all the studies about that the all the traditions that's the what they're all about how to open the channel raise the energy how to get it a bigger and bigger and bigger volume all the time which raises that magnetic field and the electrical field and all the electrical activity in your body and your brain and your heart and your consciousness, improving your consciousness. The more that we can do that and expand our heart awareness with it at the same time, uh, we'll be healing ourselves on all levels, psychologically, spiritually, everything. 
and help that happen to all the other people on the planet. That's the goal of the ancient teachings, the Egyptians, the, um, the Hedekas, the Katasi people, and, and everybody else I've studied. This is their goal, to raise the consciousness and awareness and awakeness of all of humanity. Hopefully we can do it really fast, soon. You mentioned that um, a while ago anyway, but working with the Red Door helps with that a great deal as well. Yeah. And I, there's a significant difference. The Dance of the Earth by Our Serpent, when I have clients that I work on who do that ceremony, everything I do works faster. They're just holding so much more life and energy to work with. You know, it, it's it's there's so much more available they're doing their own self-healing and ultimately that's why i've stuck to you guys for so long is i'm a control freak and what ultimately through the ancient um, healing arts and the red door is about self-healing and nothing you know it's just like i'm less dependent on other other information and other people trying to figure this stuff out I mean, it really caters to us control freaks who want to find, you know, move over WebMD. <laughs> not that Google and that information doesn't also supply, but it's just like, instead of guessing, it's just like having real answers and real solutions available in your own home. It's, that part is pretty fantastic, but the, the life energy part is such a huge huge healing in itself and it's you know it's you make it easy you know it's just like the bringing back the ancient ceremony that just really significantly makes a difference in in everything mental health physical health it's it's just a real basic thing that everybody can do for themselves that's true yeah we're gonna spell spend a whole webinar on that Oh, good. <laughs> I'm going to let you, I see there's Annika's question and Jennifer's question, so I'm not going to touch Annika's last one. <laughs> and everybody's like, what is it? I, I think those are great questions. They are great questions. I don't know if you want to bundle her, answer Jennifer's first and then just bundle all Annika's. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, that's actually a good idea. Let's go Do to I Jennifer. read Jennifer's? Yeah, go ahead. I see, Jennifer, my question is about the layers of healing when tangible results are not seen, even through, even though healing may be in progress. How do we address trust um, in things that are working when the results aren't as immediately as popping a pill? <laughs> well, yeah. I got to question the immediacy of popping a pill. <laughs> I guess it depends on what kind of pill you're popping and what for. Um, like a pain pill, it's going to take a few minutes and it might get rid of your pain. But what kind of cost? It's a it's a band-aid and it's a really bad one. But um, yeah, sometimes. Things happen really fast and immediately. Um, I've had so many of these uh, stories of working on people and they immediately feel it. I think I told the story about when Helmut and I were first married and he caught a flu when I got the uh, just the right group of rates in the bowl. And within just a couple of minutes, he was up and, and um, asking me, what, what did I do? What did I do? <laughs> I feel great. I'm cured. And it really was just a few minutes. It was just a few minutes. So the broadcast wasn't even finished broadcasting. It had only been in there a few minutes. And there's so many. I was working on this 
a lady, uh, she was in her car and she's driving in LA traffic, bad traffic. <laughs> and she's feeling really bad. She's had all these symptoms and flu and she had this, um, she was supposed to be headed towards the airport to go to someplace like India or, you know, she had a big flight and a lot of work ahead of her. And so I immediately started working on her. And while she's still driving, she's going, oh my God, oh my God, this, I feel better. That pain is gone. That thing, you know, I've, my stomach ache is gone. My cold is gone. It was only a few minutes. So there are those that happen really fast like that. A lot of them actually. And there's things, other kinds of things that you might be working on that are a little bit deeper. Uh, maybe a little more complex inside your body, uh, affecting a number of different areas all at once. And in, especially if there's something old, something that's been there a long time, it has a lot of time to have created a big momentum of its own. And so when we work on um, healing, whether it's with the red door or whether it's energy healing or the two mixed together, we're trying to undo that momentum, the one that's been making you sick, full of blueprints that are all cockeyed and broken so that your body is trying to follow the broken blueprints and you, it just keeps making you sick. That's why a lot of, of different healing techniques or even things like herbs and stuff, so sometimes just don't work. They don't seem to have much effect at all because there's such a big momentum um, going in the wrong direction with the wrong blueprints. So when we're working, we're, we're replacing old blueprints. Sometimes we have to replace them a number of times, or we have to keep the broadcast going um, for a long time, days, weeks, months. When I was working on um, this young lady's eyes and trying to reattach her retinas and uh, heal that optic nerve and have that whole junction functional again. This, this went on for months and months and months and months, probably to, in total a couple of years. And it was getting better slowly. And she could see the difference. The doctors could see the difference. Every time she went in for one of her examinations, they could see the retina was reattaching, that the optic nerve was improving, the sight tests and all these other things that they were giving her, um, they were improving very slowly. And of course, they thought it was the prednisone that they were giving her, the steroids, which is impossible. It's, they don't do that. They just lower information, inflammation. That's all they do. So they couldn't possibly have any effect. But um, we just, you just keep going. You, you got to have some patience. And you got to realize that if this has been broken for a long time, it may take a while to, to fix it completely. Sometimes I've seen things that were broken for a really long time like that, that just got fixed super fast, just boom. You just, you don't know. We're not in a place um, to really be able to see those things or be, predict them accurately. When we're working on, um, with ancient energy healing, we're talking to the spirits all the time. We're talking to people's body parts, the spirits of the body parts and their diseases. And those spirits know those answers. They know if it can happen super fast. Uh, and we can ask them. 
you can get a better picture of what it's going to take. Another aspect that has um, a, a, a really strong effect on people is their own psychological state of being, their belief system. And what kind of relationship do they have with this disease, with their illness? For some people, it's been there a really long time and they've begun to identify with it. They don't know how to be without the illness being there. So even though on one level, they desperately want to get healed and, and want to be better, um, they can be restricting some of that healing all by themselves. So with our energy healings and with the bowl healings, we have ways of working with that to help um, change that psychological state. People have to do their own work themselves. Um, yeah, that's the bottom line. But we can help a lot. There's a lot that we can do to help move them in, in that direction. And usually, as soon as they get one little peak of something getting better, the, they start uh, feeling better. They start getting, well, you could say, uh, more of a belief in the possibility of being able to heal it. All right. Great stuff. I want to I want to touch on one more story that Laura told me yesterday about Hedda's nephew and why she got niece, so into yeah. niece and why she got uh, why she Hedda got so into this this work and, and so almost not fanatic but really really excited <laughs> about it. And Laura, go ahead, tell the story what, what happened. Oh, um, one of our classmates she, um, who um, had just started the bowl work, um, her niece had um, ingested some poison and had reached out to Kay about some of the rates, the disappearing rates, the antidote rates. And Heather had immediately got um, those rates into the bowl while her sister had um, taken the niece off to the hospital. By the time they got her to the hospital, they couldn't find any poison in her system. <laughs> yeah, so it was pretty, there's, there's some immediate stuff like that. And then there's, I have some clients that, um, I have a type one diabetic who is, you know, um, who is the best client ever, does everything I say. And his doctor said he'd never be off insulin, never, 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 never. These things were possible. And um, to his doctor, he calls me his nutritionist. <laughs> and two years later, it, the doctor is encouraging him to reduce his insulin because he doesn't need it as much. But it's been slow and steady, and he's listened to everything. And, I, you know, I have other clients. It's the, the linear things, I call them. You know, linear habits. <laughs> There's always going to be a linear aspect to this, too. You know, you, I, I have clients that will undo the doing <laughs> as fast as I'm doing it. And so that's some of the – and we help. I mean, we help. That's part of it is learning – through this work, what habits maybe have harmed you and just stop those because as we often say, this isn't a, a plan B pill, you know, it's this like, there's a little, if you didn't know better, but yeah, if you keep the habits that it's not going to work in the way you want, you know, if you're still eating, drinking, you know, living a lethargic life, you know, it's, it's not going to, there are some things that just, you can't work around. You've got to make linear change, health changes too. Yeah. I've had, had clients who, um, because of their addiction to different things, foods, alcohol, smoking, um, they make some headway, some good big steps. And it's very exciting. And their addiction kind of does a bungee cord on them and, pulls them back in and, and then they go right downhill. Yeah. 
So what that means is that people have to work on their own healing as well. You have to be able to be willing to take some of those steps and some changes. They're not all that big. They're not, they're well, they're fast. definitely made easier with the, this healing work is you, the successes come quicker. And so successes are addictive in itself, it, you know, and especially when you're doing the work yourself and you see the sliding back because of the habit, <laughs> because you're measuring your own, you know, health and healing, how the, your number's going up. And then all of a sudden, yeah, whooped it up one weekend and they slide back. You get, you see for yourself how your habits are affecting your health. And it's, um, you know, there's, you're easier convinced by your direct experience with it. That's true. <laughs> All right. Great Thanks, questions. Guys. And um, we have a few questions from Annika. If anybody else has any other questions, put them in the Q&A uh, thing. Um, and the next one from Annika is, will you offer an education on this? <laughs> yes. Um, we have two different radionics classes, uh, Red Door Bowl um, healing classes. And one is uh, the bigger, fuller, starts from the beginning, goes into a very advanced kind of work. Uh, and that's, yeah, all these kind of things, they're in there. They're, they're part of the teaching. They're important parts. And we're doing um, what we call a quick start, which gives you everything that you would need in your um, starting off and in the how-to. And it also contains a, a lot of these different pieces of information about um, like we were just talking about with, with our habits and addictions and changing, changing a little, little bits of that stuff, little lifestyle things and how much difference that can make for yourself as the practitioner and on yourself and everybody else around you and encouraging others that you're working on to do the same or similar things so that they also can help themselves and heal themselves. Okay, and uh, next one for Monica. <laughs> this is a good one. Will our body repair itself as soon as we start to clean up our bad stories? Or do I need to work on the body itself? What I mean is we store all these bad energies also in our energy field. Do we need to work on the body if we just clean up all the energies and become luminous again? Will not then the body begin to heal itself anyway? Sure, not everybody searches for song and luminosity. Um, I suppose luminosity. And sure, then I need to work with the body. But what happens if one awakens fully and is in song all the time? Is it then important to work on the body itself? Oh God, how I wait for that time where everybody is awake. <laughs> Indeed. Probably um, you would have to do some things to help your body along, even if you had a, a somewhat sudden song awakening and, and just became uh, very, very conscious and stayed that way that helps your physical body a lot. And a lot of those energetic things that we've been holding on to that have been held, holding our consciousness back and holding us asleep, um, they would be disappearing with that. But maybe not all of them. It's going to be a really individual thing. And if you had uh, some cell damage from these bad things staying in your body and these energetic things that we hang on to, they do cause cell damage. They, they cause and continue um, all kinds of different uh, disorder in our body. 
So one way or the other, we really need to address them and work on them. And with the cell damage, it may take just a little bit longer to be healing it all up, have your body be able to heal itself and correct those things. And it's entirely possible for some people that some of that damage was just too far gone that the body can't really fully repair some of that injury. That's, that is a possibility. But we have seen some incredible things uh, where the body has healed stuff that was absolutely not supposed to be able to be healed at all. Growing things back that weren't supposed to be able to grow back. Uh, all just miracles. It's all kinds of miracles. But it's an individual thing. And there's so many factors involved in people's individual lives. It's we can't we can't say it uh, like a blanket for sure. Everybody can do this or end up this way or that way for everybody. It just doesn't work that way. We're too different. And our lives have been too different. And the kind of uh, energy junk we're carrying is also very different from each other. The physical things that have gone wrong, uh, that's all very unique when, to each person. It's very unique. I think there's also the, the reality that I mean, as humans, we, there's more and more people who work on becoming awake, on living awake. But we are quite a ways away from it. I mean, our elders, your grandparents, they called us a child race. Yeah. And I, I don't know, I, I do not know anybody else who has done as much work with this as you have. And you still got very sick and you, you dove into the ancient the healing arts and the, and the red door work, this kind of work. And you worked for it for years to, to get you where you are today. Yes. So, so some things healed very, very fast. Um, I had a really bad bacterial infection uh, at one time, and I, I was in Europe, <laughs> and I didn't know uh, anybody but Helmut, <laughs> didn't have any money, and um, uh, I got really, really sick. I called uh, my friend Dorothy, who I learned radionics with, and uh, she immediately started, you know, testing and hunting for what was there, and found it, broadcast it. Um, it disappeared right away. Disappeared right away. So that's, uh, I've had that kind of thing. Um, and, and things that lasted a lot longer. But also the, some of that, there's, in the pieces of it, there are things that as soon as it was discovered, um, and this was with Red Door and with Radionics, exactly what germs I had in my back. Um, and that was broadcast, those went away. And I could feel it. I went from not being able to uh, sit up or stand up. Um, I could sort of be upright with Helmut's help. <laughs> he could just like carry me, drag me to the bathroom kind of thing. 
what I had in my back was a combination of two things. One was mercury poisoning, and the other was polio that comes from the um, very first polio sugar cubes that were ever distributed. And they create their own polio disease. It's not exactly the same as the polio that they're trying to prevent. It's a, it's a little bit different. It has actually a different uh, rate for it radionically. But as soon as that was discovered and broadcast, it was, it was like somebody turned a light switch. So I, I immediately got a hold of Dorothy and uh, asked her what she did. <laughs> I know you did something. <laughs> so getting rid of the, all the mercury, that took a little longer. But it got, I got rid of it. All right. I hope that answered that question. And here's the last one. That's an interesting one. And will you give us the sizes of the bowl so we can create one? <laughs> Thank you so much for offering all your wisdom. <laughs> it's not an easy thing to create. <laughs> I tried it with every material that I could think of and get my hands on. And some materials, um, well, it's kind of complicated. It's an energetic uh, interaction and in a very basic um, atomic level of, of uh, chemical interaction with, with different things. When you try to build a bowl out of a material that the bowl doesn't like, that nature doesn't like, like something really synthetic and poisonous, um, you, you don't get the field. You don't, it doesn't make a scalar field. So you, you, don't, you don't have the tool. It doesn't matter how exact it is. If the materials are wrong, it, the energy just stops. The fields stop. So uh, if you know anybody who wants to experiment with that, uh, I'd love to to hear what your results uh, come out like. Uh, my college training is in art and sculpture specifically. And I've used many, many different kinds of materials. Uh, everything you could dream up, I've probably had my hands in. This shape is really difficult. Doesn't look like it, it looks very simple but trying to get the lines all clean and straight in the corners where the side meets the floor, clean and straight and keep the round and keep everything within the tolerances that needs to be to create that scalar wave is very tricky, very, very tricky. And the, the ancient ones that were discovered in Georgia and uh, Alabama they were made out of a kind of terracotta. That means clay that's mixed with straw kind of stuff. They were pretty accurate. They were really clean and accurate. Uh, I try to imagine myself doing that and maintaining, just in developing the accuracy while the material is still wet. That's hard enough. But that kind of material with the clay it's going to distort as it dries. So you have to do something to keep that from happening or keep repairing it. Or um, it's, just, it's a tricky, tricky shape artistically. <laughs> uh, I think you covered it. The, the important part that you touched on anyways is if, if it's just a little bit off, you don't have a scalar wave. You don't have the connection. And then all you have is a fruit bowl. <laughs> Anyways, you have worked like, what, 
going on three decades almost to, to develop this and refine this. So there's some work that needs to get into it. Even if there are students of ours who are artistically inclined very well, and they have red doors and they don't even touch it to make down. So I think, I think we covered that. This, um, this red door is, is very tight with, within its tolerances uh, geometrically. The materials are some of its favorite materials for creating the scalar wave. And it's pretty hard to beat. It's pretty, pretty hard to beat. Um, I think I mentioned once before, uh, my friend Dorothy and I, we were studying the radionics together and working with it together. And I was starting to develop the bowls. And we decided, um, well, in my tests, uh, I found that certain rocks uh, would make a really, really good bowl. It would, it would make a good scalar wave, be, hold a lot of energy, transfer a lot of energy, especially something like um, uh, granite because it's uh, made out of quartz. Lots and lots and lots of tiny little pieces of quartz all squished together. Well, granite is really, really hard to carve. <laughs> hard to carve accurately. But we found a crazy uh, stone worker. He usually worked on making gravestones and that kind of stuff. And he had all the tools and he was intrigued and he just really got excited about it. And he managed to make one. It took him, oh, I don't know. I think it was like, must have been nine months or maybe it was longer than that. He just kept working at it, working at it, working at it. And he didn't try shaping the outside at all. So it was all, you know, lumpy and, and rough. Uh, but he was shaping the inside. He was trying to get the, uh, the, the circle and the clean, flat floor and the straight wall and have it be close to the right size. He did get close enough. It, did, uh, it wasn't anywhere near as smooth and accurate on the inside as the wood ones are, you know, the ones we have right now. But for granite, it was close enough. It did make a scalar wave, and it is a nice working bowl, which Dorothy has and uses to this day. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask, um, go to Annika's last question here first. Uh, she's asking, will a stone circle in that special size do a scalar wave? to work with as well. Hmm. Um, normally our stone circles, if you look at the ratios, um, the stone circles are created, they're laid out on the floor and they're big enough for you to sit down inside of or even have a chair in there with you. So that's like three to four feet in diameter. And the rocks are, you know, anywhere from this big to about this big that people collect to make the circle out of. It does create an energy wall that goes straight up. And there's um, energy that is swirling around in, um, in you know, circular motion. So there's a number of different energy fields that are working there together, but not... Um, when it's that size at three to four feet, it's not making a scalar wave. But if you made it, you know, about the same diameter, um, you'd have to be using smaller rocks that if you did, if you kept the ratio the same, your rocks would be really little and they probably aren't going to create enough significant energy wall going up. There will be one there, but it, is, it doesn't have all the properties. If you used one with tall, tall skinny rocks that, you know, made a, a whole big 
um, like um, Stonehenge or something, <laughs> but together you'd want them almost touching. You might be able to develop a scalar wave. It would be really tricky. There would be where the rocks meet, um, there are little wobbles in their surfaces and stuff. You might not be able to get the scalar wave to happen. It would be an intriguing experiment. I think I want to emphasize that there is literally a couple of decades in this development and you can't just go out and duplicate it. That's <laughs> just not going to happen overnight. You can if you want to and spend years on it, but that would be my thoughts on this. Okay. That's, well, that's very true. It's, it's just not real likely that you're going to end up having a scalar wave happen. But it's, it's an interesting thought. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And last two questions on the board here. Uh, one is from Tara and the, one, the other one is from Annika and they are kind of about the same thing. And Tara is asking, what are the next steps to begin? What are the costs to purchase the bowl and sign up for the quick start? And so Annika is asking, so when we become students for this work, how do we get a bowl? Um, I have been working on that information and, and those pages and I was hoping to have it ready for this webinar, but alas, I don't but they will be ready for the next one. And we give you links to those and you can check it all out and all the options and everything that's there and what it's gonna look like. So all that is coming. Great questions, all of you, really great questions. Great questions. Thank you so much. Um, you guys have any other thoughts? No. No, I think that that's pretty good. We, so, covered, we covered a lot. That's a lot really of stuff. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Any it last any last question from the audience? Although we're coming, we are past ninety minutes again. That's all right. <laughs> we seem to go past a lot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But it's really good stuff. Let's leave it at that. A uh, couple of things, our uh, address, katasereddoor.com and laura, lauracaddy.com, right? Yep, L-O-R-A-K-E-D-D-I-E. -E. A little different spelling of Laura. All right, and then there's the next week's webinar. That's all about the importance of life energy that we touched on today. And then the week after, on a, on a we on a Sunday, Laura's bowling party. Yeah, so. if you want to touch, see, there'll be other pr practitioners there with us too. But it'll, it'll give you a chance to actually physically look at the bowl and experience the bowl. Um, and it's about a week before the quick start, um, or less than a week. It's right around the beginning of the beginning trainings too. So if you, you haven't decided this is fabulous <laughs> and you live in the area, come out, come on out, register. I need to count heads on how many people. And if you register, I'll give you the address of how to get to it. Um, and it's fun. I mean, even if you're on the fence about buying a bowl, come out and um, experience other people who are interested in this practice. There's also gonna be a couple of other students there. so. There's yes. lots of people to talk yeah. to. Yeah, there should be four of us, um, four sh wow. a Katasi shaman um, there that day is the plan. And so we can, we, can not, uh, we can answer questions about the red doors, but we can also ask questions for those who are interested in participating in the practice. Like, why are we, why are we still doing it after all these years? <laughs> yeah, uh, and we will share details about how to register for that and how to get there. And yeah. like I said, all the pages with the information about how to join the class will be up hopefully by next webinar. I work, I'm gonna work really hard. I think that's it. Kay, you were amazing again. Thank you so much. Thanks, Beautiful. Kay, you're welcome. Laura, thank you so welcome. much for doing all this with us.
Oh, thank you. This is fun. And everybody who joined us, thank you so much for being here live. And the recording should be up very soon, very quickly too. All right. Beautiful days. <laughs> Love you. Bye-bye. Love you Love all. Bye-bye.